Hello, my name is Tamar Friedman, Director of Peer Programs at Jewish Funders Network, and I'm pleased to welcome you to today's webinar on the topic of Israel's second wave, political uncertainty and social un unrest in the wake of COVID-19. We are joined today by Yochanan Plesner, President of the Israel Democracy Institute, and Professor Tamar Herman, the Director of Gutman Center for Public Opinion at the Israel De Democracy Institute, we have been fortunate to have heard from them before and glad that we're able to, that they have been able to return to JFN to provide an update and assessment of the new Israeli government. They will outline who the main players are, what legal and political challenges may lie ahead. They will also reflect on recent protests and unrest and the implications, especially during this time of COVID-19. Now I'd like to turn it over to Yochanan to start us off today. Thank you so much, Yochanan. Hi, it's uh, my pleasure. So when we, uh, when we had our last conversation, we spoke, uh, we spoke about the end of the uh, political uh, crisis and the formation of the new government. And, uh, and uh, perhaps we were too optimistic uh, uh, to think that the political crisis was over. Um, uh, what we are seeing now, we're in the midst of a uh, of a new uh, phase of the political crisis. In a few, in a couple of weeks, we will know whether we are entering a fourth election uh, uh, campaign within uh, less than two years or a year and a half. And and again, the word unprecedented is is uh, uh, is completely unfit to describe uh, uh, the political situation. Um, um, this is uh, happening in the backdrop of a health crisis. We have uh, uh, in front some of the figures, uh, uh, the casualties are around 600 uh, deaths, uh, close to 80,000 uh, uh, positively uh, identified uh, uh, COVID-19 uh, uh, carriers, about between 1,000 and 2,000 new cases per day. Um, and, uh, and Israel was, uh, as, as many of you are aware, was uh, fast to uh, uh, catch up the second wave of the pandemic after uh, quite a successful wave from a health crisis, both in terms of the numbers and in terms of the public perception. Uh, the economic uh, uh, recession is uh, uh, like in other parts of the world, we're in, uh, in, in a very uh, low point. Uh, all in all, about 200 billion shekel of a stimulus plan out of a, just to give an indication, the annual budget in Israel, including debt repayment, is give or take close to 600 billion. So it's a big, big share of the uh, annual uh, budget. And if we entered into the crisis with a ratio of 60% debt to GDP, uh, now the estimates are that we're uh, somewhere close to uh, 80%. So we entered into the uh, crisis in a relatively uh, uh, a, a good, healthy macroeconomic state, uh, and now we're using that ammunition, and obviously it, it ought to be used uh, wisely because uh, uh, as, as in any kind of ammunition, it can, you can run out of it. Uh, the political instability uh, uh, is, uh, uh, as I mentioned in the, in the beginning, is manifested, manifests itself also in uh, in intangible uh, policy areas. Uh, the government uh, uh, made uh, a massive use of uh, emergency uh, regulations. Some were necessary, some were uh, uh, one could have done without. We, we, we had uh, uh, quite an intensive give and take over the past few months in terms of creating the regulatory and legal infrastructure uh, to enable the government on the one hand to deal with the crisis and on the other hand not to uh, exaggerate with infringing the privacy of Israelis and, and, and using unnecessary emergency regulation with no proper oversight uh, by the Knesset. Uh, um, uh, the uh, uh, annexation issue uh, that was uh, uh, put on the agenda by the Prime Minister after the first wave of the crisis uh, now seems to uh, be at least uh, temporarily off the table. The Americans say that it depends on the Israelis. The Israelis say that it depends on the Americans. And the Israeli public, as Tamar might uh, 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 touch upon it uh, later on, has uh, little, if any, interest in that uh, uh, issue. Um, 
and and uh, and of course uh, um, uh, we're experiencing um, a very unique uh, wave of uh, public uh, uh, protests that are uh, not so much top down but very much bottom up with multiple agendas some of them are economically related uh, some have to do with uh, 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 the sense of uh, uh, exasperation of many Israelis uh, uh, by the illegitimacy of the idea of a prime minister serving under an indictment. Uh, so it's a combination of interests very much coming from the bottom up. Uh, Israelis uh, on every uh, uh, Saturday evening throughout the more than 200 bridges throughout the country uh, are uh, protesting for the past few weeks. Uh, Tamar will discuss some of the figures around the protest and some of the uh, potential implications. Uh, it's unclear what the implications would be, but for sure we're, we're witnessing something uh, new, something that we haven't seen for sure since the, uh, the social protest of 2011. Um, uh, but since it's so disparate, uh, and, and, and lacks coherent leadership. Uh, this is also parts of it, part of its, its strength, but, uh, but it also might uh, lead it over time to, to uh, dissipate. Um, uh, just as a recap, this is the outcome of the election and the makeup of the, uh, gov the current government that is made up of uh, 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 the two ultra-Orthodox uh, uh, parties, uh, Likud, uh, Blue and White, and uh, and, uh, and uh, parts of, uh, of uh, labor that adds up to 70 something uh, member, uh, 74 member uh, coalition, supposedly a solid coalition that can deal with, uh, with such a, a severe uh, crisis. It provides a broad parliamentary base. Uh, one of uh, the, the predictions that we had uh, before said that this coalition will probably um, 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 carry out a policy of a ceasefire in the, the democratic uh, rule of law areas, in the areas of religion and state, i.e. a mutual veto power, and nothing much will happen in those areas, but it does have the potential, the broad parliamentary base, to lead uh, a, a, a much necessary economic reforms. If we look at Israel's history, uh, a vivid example would be the mid-80s hyperinflation, national unity government reforming uh, 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 the economy and the public sector uh, to an extent that we uh, uh, enjoyed the benefits uh, in many ways to this uh, day of those reforms that were taking place in the mid-80s. So this, this was the opportunity that was presented by this government, uh, ceasefire in many areas and reform. The, the um, uh, uh, situation de facto um, uh, uh, proved to be uh, quite different. So, you know, th th those are the reasons why they entered into the government, you know, the, in the midst of a massive crisis, no one could form a government, neither Gantz could, uh, uh, Gantz didn't have the numbers to form a government, neither did Netanyahu. Uh, uh, the real uh, uh, option Default option was a fourth election campaign. Netanyahu wanted to continue to serve as a prime minister, wasn't sure about the option of a fourth election uh, with the economy uh, in free fall and wanted to gain the legitimacy and so on that uh, uh, he might gain from uh, uh, continuing to serve with uh, Gantz as his partner. Um, uh, Netanyahu also had a political goal of, of uh, dismantling the, the main opposition party, blue and white, and, and, he, and he very much achieved it. Gantz uh, understood that a fourth election campaign, you know, in the situation that blue and white was, they were in a sort of negative uh, momentum. Uh, he thought that uh, while he will violate his main campaign promise of not serving under Netanyahu, he at least can achieve uh, that ceasefire situation of defending rule of law and democratic institutions. This is why he insisted on the justice ministry and he thought we will defend the rule of law and allow for economic reform. So those were the uh, justifications, at least in the eyes of, of, uh, of both of them. Obviously, Gantz paid a major price uh, within his own uh, uh, political base. He led to dismantling his own uh, party 
and, and, and his own, uh, and the source of his political power, and the only uh, platform that was an alternative ruling party for the past decade since Kadima in 09. Uh, but that was history two months ago. Uh, fast forward, um, the, uh, uh, the main, uh, uh, the coalition agreement stipulated that they would pass a budget for the remaining of 2020, uh, the year of 2020, and then uh, th throughout uh, 2021, uh, i.e. that meant that, one, that with one vote, uh, 100 days from the day that the government would be formed, they would um, agree on the major pillars and cornerstones of, of the economic policy of the government, and, and that would also provide a political horizon, political stability, and, in, and would allow the, the rotation to take place somewhere around November of 2021, uh, the rotation between uh, uh, Gantz and, uh, and uh, Netanyahu. Uh, the Israeli law, uh, 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 based on the, Isra the Israeli law, uh, determines that if a budget is not passed 100 days after a government is formed, or uh, every in, in every year, uh, three months, at the end of three months, end of March, after, uh, uh, after uh, December 31st, if there's no budget, the Knesset automatically um, uh, dissolves uh, 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 disintegrates or dissolves itself. And uh, this is what the situation that we're at. The government uh, uh, will celebrate, quote unquote, 100 days on uh, August 24th. And, and that means that if a budget does not, is not passed until then, the Knesset automatically disintegrates itself. Uh, Mr. Netanyahu now is not uh, uh, interested in, uh, in, 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 uh, in fulfilling the coalition agreement and passing a budget for 20, uh, for both years, his claim is that uh, uh, somehow some economic claim. I feel it's you know there obviously there's no reason to uh, uh, repeat it because it, it's clearly understood that the um, rationale is is political and unfortunately uh, 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 very personal. Um, and that's his his only way out of avoiding the November uh, 2021 uh, uh, rotation. His trial is set to intensify in January, i.e. Uh, three meetings per week. That means that the Israeli public come January will see Mr. Netanyahu as prime minister three out of five uh, business days every week sitting in court and, and, and managing a very complex, uh, difficult uh, uh, trial. And, uh, and, and a trial that Mr. Netanyahu so far didn't even begin to prepare towards. He, he keeps changing his legal team. He doesn't want to pay for it with his own money. He didn't get uh, authorization to raise uh, 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 funds from businessmen for, uh, for that purpose. So Netanyahu, uh, uh, Netanyahu's major uh, trial is beginning in a few months. And, and so far, he, he does not provide any indication that he's, he's, he's preparing for that. He's, uh, he, he, he also thinks that the Supreme Court at that point might determine that he's in a conflict of interest and cannot serve while also having to go to court, to court three days a week. Um, uh, uh, there is some fear also for him that the um, uh, economic situation will not uh, uh, get any better, so he can't do much better than now. And of course, there's a, a risk on his behalf that the U.S. administration might switch in November and uh, a very friendly uh, Trump administration will be uh, uh, replaced by a Biden administration that might be friendly to Israel, but not necessarily uh, uh, to Netanyahu himself. And of course, there's a political argument for Netanyahu um, and not to, uh, 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 to go for an early election or fourth election. Now, now that he dismantled uh, blue and white, there's no uh, coherent uh, uh, opposition uh, that he needs to confront, contend with, and Gantz's leadership numbers are very much uh, impaired. So the, 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 there's a, the, that's a very strong case for uh, Mr. Netanyahu to go for an election, and obviously the case against is that, as Tamar will show uh, 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 briefly, um, there's uh, uh, the, the the situation in Israel is extremely. Um, uh, Un unstable also in terms of public opinion. While the voting patterns look uh, 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 quite safe for Mr. Netanyahu, the, the, the seats that he's losing are going to Mr. Bennett and are remaining in the right wing plus ultra-Orthodox bloc that is actually growing. 
So in this respect, it's a good case for him to go for an election if he's only thinking about the uh, political dimension. Um, we're seeing that there's a large numbers of dissatisfaction, alienation, distrust in Netanyahu's leadership in all aspects and dimensions, except for the security dimension. So there's an understanding that uh, there's something that we, we might not be figuring out altogether because something is happening. Israelis are going out to the streets in big numbers, high levels of dissatisfaction. Uh, the economic situation is unprecedentedly or unprecedented and, and very bad. So even, uh, you know, just counting on the numbers, it, it, uh, it, uh, he might end up uh, losing everything. But perhaps if he sees uh, the uh, sitting in the option as going to court three days a week in, November, in January, then going for an election is a legal strategy that is aimed at achieving a majority of at least 61 for the right wing plus ultra-Orthodox camp, and then legislating his way out of his legal uh, woes uh, uh, by either a French law or any other uh, retroactive uh, piece of legislation that was, uh, will obviously be extremely controversial and, and, uh, and, uh, and, and probably unconstitutional. So, um, so what would a fourth election, if we're actually entering into such a scenario where we still, you know, there's a high likelihood, but we still don't know, what, what would that mean? Obviously, Israel is, is entering a, a COVID-19, the third expected wave uh, come the fall and, and, and winter. Uh, uh, with all the economic and health uh, uh, implications, it means that we will enter that period without uh, uh, a budget, neither a budget for 2020 nor a budget for 2021. The last budget that was passed in Israel uh, is uh, and, and, and prepare for that was a budget that was passed for 2018 and 2019 back in 20 and a budget that was formed in 2017. So if we're entering a fourth election, it will mean that in some time, perhaps in 2021, will be the first time that we are passing a budget since 2017. This is a, a country that is basically unmanaged. And uh, uh, as a result of you know, those uh, uh, personal woes and issues of a very powerful uh, 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 politician, and uh, so that would mean massive uh, economic implications. And obviously, uh, should a, a majority, something that is, you know, a, a likely, you know, a possibility, should Mr. Netanyahu achieve the majority that he's aiming for, for uh, of a right-wing plus ultra-orthodox uh, ma uh, majority, uh, the aim would be to pass a French law, uh, an extended override clause that would allow him to sort of move the Supreme Court out of the way. And, and, and allow him to uh, dodge his uh, legal state. So what's at stake is not so much Netanyahu's personal uh, fate, but very much also the independence of the judiciary, uh, the fate of rule of law, and, and so on. So, and, and of course, the fate of our economy in a very dire situation. So this is, those are obviously some of the uh, drawbacks if we're entering a situation of a fourth uh, uh, election. And um, what is the protest uh, effect? Well. As we've seen, it's a, it's a very much comes from the, the bottom up, grassroots, many messages, not clearly pr uh, uh, translated into, into concrete political demands. Uh, I'm interested to hear what Tamar has to say about it. It, it probably has, it, it's, it, it, it constitutes both the source of strength and of weakness of this protest. I do think that if uh, uh, we are heading towards an election, this protest will very much serve a role of consolidating and firing up the, in the, in the anti-Netanyahu uh, 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 voices, voices that are, 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 uh, have strong resonance at the grassroots level, but the political platforms that are supposed to represent them are now uh, fractured because of the, the disintegration of, uh, of, uh, of blue and white. So I think when Netanyahu is making his calculations, the protests are both a, a risk for him because they uh, are firing up both his, his own crowd and a crowd of, of those who are infected by the economic mismanagement of the crisis. And, and those are not necessarily, uh, you know, anti-BB uh, uh, people, but very much there's disappointment also among Likud uh, 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 voters. But he can also use this protest 
as a way to uh, fire up his own base, look at those people, they're, uh, you know, uh, again, using the kind of uh, uh, identity politics and uh, uh, as a way to firing up his own crowd. But that, that will mean, uh, because uh, what's at stake is, is literally the, the personal fate of, of, a, of a very uh, powerful uh, politician, uh, that means that if we are heading towards an election, it's going to be an election uh, that is uh, uh, extremely uh, emotional, uh, uh, expected to be full of incitement, hopefully without violence, but we can't not, cannot be sure about it. Not a very, uh, 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 not a part of our history, the upcoming few months that, uh, that I think we are going to uh, uh, reminisce about. Finally, can we uh, avoid the, the election? Um, look, if, we're, if we are to avoid the, the election, uh, and, and uh, it, it will probably mean that Mr. Netanyahu, uh, who has most of the cards in his hands and he can uh, uh, allow or cause the prevention of an election, um, that will probably mean that he saw some um, uh, polls that demonstrate to him that it's not uh, a good idea to go for an election where uh, at, at, at best we can hope for a continued democratic ceasefire. Although so far it's not the word continued would be wrong because so far we didn't enjoy quote unquote that ceasefire. The justice minister from blue and white is constantly finding himself um, um, uh, at clash with the uh, uh, Netanyahu loyalists and so on. So at best we can hope for a ceasefire in the areas of religion and state a rule of law, we can hope for uh, an improved and more competent management of the COVID-19 crisis and, ho and hopefully uh, much required uh, economic reforms that will exploit these, the, the opportunities that are embedded in this crisis to put the Israeli uh, uh, economy and society on a new trajectory. This for sure is an option that exists within this a government. What we cannot expect is electoral reform. We cannot expect uh, 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 any compromises in the areas of religion and state. And again, structural economic reforms, although I hope for them, they so, uh, so far if we judge based on the current conduct of the government, we can hope for a budget with some assistance for self-employed and, and unemployed, but not much more than that at this point. Um, uh, and uh, I think uh, uh, if we uh, obviously go back to the Israeli public, the vast majority uh, are not, do not support uh, an early election. We've been through it for three times. We, we've achieved the same outcome. No reason to expect that in a fourth election there will be a different outcome. And perhaps a fourth might lead to a fifth or a sixth, and, 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 uh, and, and, and therefore uh, hopefully it could be prevented. Um, uh, with that, uh, we can uh, uh, pass on to Tamar and then uh, engage in the discussion. Thank you. Hi, Ochanan. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'll try and, and continue with the same line that uh, Yohanan marked thus far. But I'll look at the situation from the public opinion uh, climate or sentiment or what have you, because uh, we've been experiencing a very rapid change in this uh, uh, climate. And, and when I say climate, I refer to the entire political spectrum. It is not that one side is happy and the other side is depressed. In fact, in the last uh, 10 years or so, Israel uh, was um, located uh, between the 11th and the 13th place in, in general happiness by international indicators. As of today, there was a new report uh, published by the Central Statistics Bureau of Israel, and they showed that Israelis in general are rather depressed. It is really unbelievable the change that has happened with quote unquote only 600 people dead of the COVID-19, but the atmosphere here is, is pretty negative. And I'll show you some indications for that. And this, of course, has some far-reaching political, economic, and other implications. By the way, for example, in this report that was just released by the Central Statistics Bureau, it appears that 
most Israelis, over 70 something percent, said that they uh, uh, are not going to make any big uh, purchase or, or uh, so, some, some uh, they are not going to buy a new home, they are not buying, going to buy a new car, they are not go going to invest large sums of money. This all reflects the sense of uncertainty that is so strong in Israel right now, and I'll uh, show you now uh, the numbers, okay? So uh, my title was Distrust, Protest, and the Possibility of uh, a New Elections. We asked uh, our uh, interviewees uh, in uh, the series of the Corona Day surveys, we asked them to express the level of trust or distrust in the decision makers. And we presented them with four options. The uh, medical experts, the government medical experts, Prime Minister Netanyahu, uh, the government treasury and economic experts, and the health minister. Actually, I should have said health ministers because the health ministers, uh, um, we have a new uh, uh, health minister, as uh, Edelstein replaced Litzman. So on top, uh, we see the uh, government medical experts, and uh, it's quite reasonable because they are looked upon as uh, uh, the most professional in dealing with this uh, kind of crisis. Then second comes uh, the prime minister who uh, in the first wave and even uh, a bit afterwards was the person who took full, full responsibility for what was happening. Then uh, the people from the treasury and uh, uh, the economic uh, uh, um, advisors of Netanyahu and uh, uh, below you see the health minister. However, as you can see, they were pretty stable until early June. Since early June, what we see is a sharp drop in uh, the public trust in all four actually figures. The, the uh, uh, health minister is uh, non-existent uh, uh, right now. And therefore, I mean, he is of course, uh, uh, he's there, but uh, his, his uh, presence is, is very minimal. So in our latest poll, we didn't ask about him. But he was replaced by someone else, and we will uh, have the data in a couple of days. But basically, as you can see, the drop uh, can be seen on all three levels. The medical experts, and this is because they were challenged very, very often by their colleagues from outside of the government. So people start to believe that they have the key to uh, uh, the, the solution and uh, uh, lost faith in them as well. And then uh, the decline in uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu from 56 at the beginning of the crisis to 30 uh, in, in uh, mid-July. And the same goes for the economic experts. They are the lowest Ever. And this is, by the way, very typical to Israeli public opinion, the fact that the gaps between uh, uh, the three uh, uh, subjects of inquiry here are, are uh, very, very solid and, and they are very stable. We don't see that Netanyahu is in one point above the medical expert and one point below the medical expert. They, they are very ordered in, in, in the level of trust which they got. Now we ask the evaluation of Prime Minister Netanyahu's performance with the COVID-19 crisis by voting because we wanted to see and we, we uh, compared June and July and as you can see in all parties he lost uh, uh, the, the trust or got lesser uh, grades for his performance. Um, the Shas party voters were the most positive about him uh, 76 percent in June, 68 in July. So we see here 8 percent uh, uh, drop. Likud, 83 percent in June, but only 55 percent in July. United Torah Judaism, 74 to 49, less than a half. Okay, Yemina, 64 to 43. Israel Beitenu. 32 to 23, joint list 
the Arab joint list 21 to 19, almost a very minimal change. Blue and white 21, which is fairly low, dropped to 8% only, and they are members of Netanyahu's coalition. And Labour Gesher merits 13 to 2%. So actually, what we can see is that his uh, strongest or most uh, stable foothold is amongst uh, the ultra orthodox and Likud voters. But here as well, he is losing trust of uh, his own people, not only the, those who resented him from uh, the beginning. And then we asked about his performance, uh, good, bad, or so and so. And, and we uh, segmented it by political blocks. And as you can see on the left, over three quarters said, bad or very bad. At the center, almost two thirds, and on the right, only 30%, but also 33% saying so, so. This doesn't mean that they are happy with what he is uh, doing these days. And again, we get to the 35% only who are uh, uh, trustful of uh, his uh, performance. Then we uh, tried uh, another means of measuring the public opinion, and we addressed the issue of sentiments rather than attitudes. We offered our interviewees six words in Hebrew, three positive and three negative, and we asked them to pick up one uh, which uh, expresses uh, the best their feelings about the government. Okay, so uh, what we saw is that the negative uh, uh, words or the words reflecting negative sentiments got very high percentage. Disappointment, anger, and alienation. First came disappointment, much more than anger and alienation. And the positive words like trust, pride, um, and... Uh, um, I, I can't remember now the third one, but they got very, very minimal, very minimal uh, uh, support. So among uh, labor gesher merits, 98% expressed negative sentiments towards the government. Blue and white, again, the uh, partners for Netanyahu's coalition, part of the government, 90% negative. Joint list, 84%. Israel Beitenu, 77%. Yemina, 68% of the right, not of the left. Again, the ultra-Orthodox are a bit more fond of the government, but still it's a majority of people of negative uh, uh, sentiments. And among Likud voters, again, we see 58% saying something negative about their sense about their feeling about uh, uh, the government. So actually there is not even one party uh, uh, that its voters feel something positive about uh, uh, the government, at least not in, in large numbers. And then let's go back to April. In April, uh, we asked uh, if people could see in the horizon a new wave of public protest. Okay, in April, it was a very abstract question because it was uh, Passover, people were um, at homes, people were not allowed to go out. Uh, the idea of having a street protest campaign uh, seemed a bit far-fetched at that time. But here you see, we had half of the respondents saying, yes, this is going uh, uh, to happen. And at the beginning, when we saw this data in April, we thought, it was a kind of a pie in the sky or, or a wishful thinking. However, it took not more than a month or so before it started in June, actually. This is one of the explanations. We ask people to which extent they are secure or insecure about their economic future. As you can see, the Israeli Arabs are more insecure, they are more afraid about their economic future, but also the Jewish uh, uh, segment is quite afraid. And we see here a 
an increase in the number of those uh, that feel insecure about their economic uh, uh, future. And we will see in a minute why it is so connected to the protest question. Because we ask people, uh, do you identify yourself with the economic protest or the anti-Netanyahu protest? And we uh, segmented it again by a political bloc. As you can see on the left, the dissatisfaction or the identification with the anti-Netanyahu protest is the highest, 92%, which is very, very high. But we also saw a large number of people identify with uh, uh, the economic protest. And this is very interesting because the people of the left, we know in Israel at least, they are better off economically. Many of them are uh, being employed by uh, uh, the civil service and they were not hit so strongly from the economic point of view but they take it together, the anti-Netanyahu and uh, the economic uh, uh, protest. I will talk a bit about the differences between uh, these uh, uh, two kinds of protests in, in a couple of minutes. Then we look at the center. The center, uh, three quarters, are uh, identifying themselves with the economic protest and 71% with the uh, anti-Netanyahu protest, a bit less than the economic protest, but significantly less than the center, okay? So, uh, uh, than the left. So the center is uh, less uh, uh, dissatisfied than uh, the left, but uh, uh, in comparison to the right, of course, it is really at the center because uh, on the right, we see a majority, 53% of, right-wing voters or people who located themselves along this continuum on the, on the right, that uh, they identify with the economic protest. Certainly the majority does not identify with uh, the anti-Netanyahu protest, although in uh, the last couple of days, there were new beginnings, which we cannot really say uh, right now if they are going to gain momentum or not, of people protesting against Netanyahu within the right side of the political spectrum. They started to, uh, they tried to organize some vigils and, and some small demonstrations saying that they are indeed on the right, but they want another head on top of the right. Uh, and this is uh, uh, in a way the outcome of uh, the huge uh, protest campaign that we have been uh, seeing in the last couple of days. I said huge wave of protest, but really the numbers are not that huge. Even if we take the numbers given by uh, the organizers of uh, uh, the Balfour demonstrations and also the uh, Tel Aviv Charles Claw Park demonstrations, uh, we get to something around 40,000. And with the people on the bridges and in the intersections throughout the country, let's say that they are 20,000. 60,000 are not a huge number enough in order to uh, rock the boat. Uh, in fact, um, as an expert on, on protest campaigns, um, I know that normally uh, such protest doesn't hold water more than two months and we are already there. So I suppose that if uh, something mega will not happen in the very um, foreseeable future, then in early September, again, unless something really critical happens in early September, uh, the protest is uh, going to start declining, particularly as we have the high holidays uh, on mid-September. And we know that uh, in Israel, uh, during the high holidays, uh, people are uh, going back home. This was the experience in uh, 2011, exactly the same uh, time period. It started on July 14, 2011, and it lasted until uh, September 5th, 
uh, of that year. So uh, unless uh, we will see a transition for from uh, the grassroots phase to something more institutionalized with some uh, clearer agenda of what are they aiming at uh, besides uh, Netanyahu leaving uh, his office and with some at least initial blueprint of what their demands are besides him leaving uh, his office I expect uh, this uh, protest to, to decline, maybe not sharply, but uh, uh, slowly. So uh, we asked uh, identification about identification with the anti-Netanyahu protest by voting. And here again, you see that blue and white are on top with 88% saying that they identify with uh, the protest against the prime minister in which uh, uh, government the party is part of. So uh, this uh, uh, resonates uh, with uh, uh, Yohanan's statement early on that blue and white and Likud, this is not some happy marriage, right? And, uh, and of course the leaders are looking uh, uh, back to the constituency. And when they see that their constituency is so strongly against the prime minister, of course, it uh, gives them some sense of what they can and what they cannot do without losing uh, uh, their uh, uh, public support. Okay? Uh, as you can see, Amina, Likud, uh, uh, United uh, Torah, Judaism, and Chas are, are <coughs> very much uh, uh, below. And, and this again uh, reflects the same uh, tendencies uh, that I've showed you uh, before. And we ask about the police activity towards the protesters because at the beginning of the first uh, three weeks or so, uh, uh, the police clashed with the protesters. And in fact, they gave uh, uh, the, the campaign much volume by the means which they used because uh, they created martyrs. They created the sense of martyrdom amongst the protesters. Uh, although, you know, uh, with uh, uh, the water cannons in uh, uh, mid-July and early August uh, in Israel, it is not really very horrible. But uh, uh, people got some very um, expressive visuals of this, these clashes. Um, and then uh, the police apparently learned its lesson. And uh, they are much more lenient now uh, when they treat the protesters, even if uh, uh, the demonstration is not stopped at uh, the designated time or uh, if the protesters start marching through the streets uh, around Balfu, although they didn't get a permit to do it. So uh, the police at the beginning uh, was very, very harsh. And then we asked, uh, 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 this was uh, July, we asked, uh, uh, what do you think about the police activity? And uh, you see that uh, uh, the majority said that it's either a little too harsh or much too harsh when we segmented it by uh, the political uh, um, blocks uh, left 83% said too harsh, center 72% because their people are there, left and center. Right, only 30% said that the police was uh, too harsh on the protesters. And this is my last slide. Uh, this is exactly the same slide as Yohanan showed you, but it is segmented by uh, uh, voting. Who is in favor of having um, uh, new elections? Joint list, 40%. Labor Gesher, 36. Israel Beitenu, 32. Uh, Blue and White, uh, 28. But Likud, UTJ, Shas, and Yemina the entire right are not supportive of, uh, uh, of new elections. This means that Netanyahu has a problem because from his personal point of view, elections might be a good idea. However, from his constituency point of view, 
it seems that it is not thought of as a very good idea. So he will have to make uh, some decisions whether to push towards uh, new elections based on his uh, self-confidence that he knows what's best for uh, his party, for himself, for the entire right, or to be more responsive. The problem with not being uh, too responsive is that, as I already mentioned, there are some bugs of, of uh, dissatisfaction and protest amongst his own people. So if he goes on uh, elections, say, in, in November, there is enough time for his uh, avid supporters to start a new kind uh, of, of protest against him. And this is certainly much more dangerous from his point of view. Great. Thank you both so much for, for sharing all that information. I now want to open it up to all the participants that are that are with us on the on the line. If you have a question, you can chat me or put in the Q and A box. I have a few already and can start there, but we have a few moments now to, to get to ask the experts. So please um, let me know if you have questions. So first, I want to go to to Yochanan and and ask you, you, you know, you and Tamar both mentioned possibly an election and you mentioned we're not sure if there'll be a fourth election. Um, and if it happens, what's to say if there wouldn't be a, a, a fifth or the, the sixth. So what kind of reform can be put in place to end this political instability? Well, uh, our, uh, our uh, election system is not producing a decisive outcome. This is, this is a fact. So we, we have the three election campaigns and now we're speaking of a fourth one and, and, and there's no reason to believe that it should be the last one. And, and I can't even believe that I'm uttering those sentences, but that's the reality. So um, one of the weaknesses of, uh, of our system, is, is, there are a few weaknesses. One of them, it's very easy to disintegrate our parliament if you compare it to other parliaments. So, for example, the idea that the Knesset can just decide by law to disintegrate itself, for us it looks very natural, but it's actually not the case in most parliamentary democracies. The fact uh, that uh, uh, if we do not pass a budget, whether immediately after an election or uh, at the end of the year, uh, it immediately triggers uh, a new election, again, is an Israeli invention. It's an invention that was created in order to bring about stability and better functioning of the government, but instead it's now being used as a mechanism for, uh, uh, to bring about instability. So uh, uh, the recommendations that we developed, a blueprint for electoral reform at IDI, uh, um, is designed to uh, um, uh, uh, produce an outcome that it becomes very clear who is prime minister immediately after the election, without the need of creating a coalition, makes it more difficult to disintegrate uh, 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 in the parliament than to go for an early election. Uh, and in this respect, uh, and, and allows for the option of a different majority to emerge within the Knesset and to create, rather than going for an election, an alternative government. So it creates that level of flexibility but it doesn't allow to hurl the country from election to election and ensures that once we go to an election, we can come out with a very a clear and decisive outcome. Uh, uh, we're strong advocates of electoral reform uh, uh, for years. Uh, uh, I'm not sure that now is, uh, is uh, I mean, on the, on the one hand, it's a good time to promote it because the, the Israeli public can understand the need, but in terms of the uh, political constraints, uh, the uh, alliance between Mr. Netanyahu and the ultra-Orthodox parties is so closely knit and intimate and, and, and any kind of electoral reform that will uh, uh, untie that alliance and impair the interests of, of its members uh, will be very difficult to legislate. Thank you. Is there a piece or two from what you are proposing or what IDI is proposing that you could share with us? I can uh, post, uh, perhaps post the link uh, in the chat. Then would that make sense? Yeah, uh, sure. I'm sure. I'm sure it's hard to just say it in a sentence or two, but I'm sure people would be interested in, in hearing more about about that proposal. Thank you. 
Um, and let's go to Professor Herman. Um, you mentioned that that there's declining faith in Netanyahu and the health and the health ministers and government officials. Do you have any indication of what the public thinks of guns, and do they blame him for the situation as well? How do, how what are people feeling about him right now? Well, it, it's it's. Uh... Of course, it's complicated. They do not blame him for what is happening, but they certainly see him as a very weak uh, politician, uh, maybe naive, maybe inexperienced, but not with much potential for the future. And uh, indeed, uh, I suppose that he doesn't see himself uh, in, in, in the long run as, as, as a politician anymore. Uh, a politician that says that uh, he doesn't like the idea of going to school every morning, meaning to to uh, the uh, government, parliament, or, or whatever, he doesn't project a sense of power. And many people who voted for him feel the same. So uh, he is not even thought of as a very honest uh, or decent person because of what he did um, by joining uh, Netanyahu's government. So they don't see him as the responsible side to it, but they certainly don't have uh, much appreciation for his political leadership. Mm -hmm. Amar, how would you translate Kippa Duma when many of his voters feel that there was the wolf in Kippa Duma and they voted for Kippa Duma? <laughs> interesting. interesting. Uh, um, Think Red Hood. Uh, sorry? Red Hood, how, how yeah. do you call this uh, story, kid story with... Uh, uh, oh, like Little Red Riding Hood. And yeah. Is that what you're talking about? <laughs> like, that Gantz is not the wolf. Is that the wolf? Interesting. Okay. So in terms of, and this I guess for you, um, Tamar, and for Yochanan, if things are more dire now, um, and if it seems like the situation is more dire than in 2011, why do you think more people aren't coming out to protest? Well, to start with, uh, they do feel uh, some resentment and anger and so on and so forth. Second, um, well, uh, Yohanan attended uh, one of, of the demonstrations I did uh, several times. It's fun. I mean, uh, uh, these kind of demonstrations are, are, are not uh, entirely political in the sense that there is no this tension in the air uh, this is something which is uh, uh, involved uh, with some kind of festival aspect. People are singing, people are, uh, you know, hugging and kissing with the masks and, and, and uh, very creative placards and outfits and music and, uh, and you name it. So some people are there because they are really, really concerned. Some are partly concerned, some are, are having fun. And this is one of the criticism that uh, the more purists are, uh, are saying about the kind of uh, uh, demonstrations that are being held particularly in, in Jerusalem. They say uh, this is not uh, uh, something that will bring about a massive change because People enjoy it uh, 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 too much, but uh, I would say that uh, it's it's uh, it is motivated by some sense of uh, dissatisfaction or even a high sense of dissatisfaction. But the the event is also an event uh, uh, in itself. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Thank you. Um, with a few minutes left, I have a kind of a big question, so we'll see where we could where we can get with this. I know to bring this up in the last few minutes might might be hard, but uh, maybe Yochanan for you and then Professor Herman, if you have also some things to comment about this, is that given all um, you have said about the resurgence of COVID-19, Israel's economic state, and the political instability, assuming Trump gives the green light, do you think Netanyahu will move forward with some of the annexation plans? So I know there's a lot to that question with... Well. First of all, it, it will depend if we are in an election campaign or not. Uh, if we're in an election campaign, uh, uh, he might not be able to respond positively to a U.S. president because uh, there's only so much that an interim government can do. There's a limited authority and it cannot uh, change the, the sort of the, 
the uh, diplomatic landscape mm -hmm. in, in such a way, a government that is supposed to be a caretaker in between two election campaigns. If we're not in an election campaign, I don't think it will come at this point from Netanyahu's side because he has so much to deal with in terms of the level of dissatisfaction, distrust, alienation, and so on of, uh, of voters. And the voters don't see that as a high priority issue uh, and, and, uh, at this point. So I don't think it will, Netanyahu will be the initiator. Perhaps if Mr. Trump decides to use this issue as an issue to fire up his evangelical base to demonstrate, basically to push this gift up the Israeli throat and uh, in order to achieve a domestic uh, uh, political uh, uh, goals, i.e. whether if he, if he discovers in focus groups and uh, swing states like Florida and so on, then that will um, do the difference. Um, and Netanyahu will not be in, be in an election uh, campaign. Um, I think it will be difficult for Mr. Netanyahu to resist uh, a direct uh, request from the president after the president helped Netanyahu in his own campaigns. So if that will happen, we're in a real issue. And please ask me to respond again. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and now we have just about two minutes left. So I wanted to just open the floor to both of you if there's any last comments about about anything that we spoke about today or about you know what you're what you're thinking is going to happen going forward. I would just like to say a word about uh, the difference between the protests in Tel Aviv in and in, in Jerusalem. Uh, and uh, it is interesting because in Jerusalem it is much more anti-Netanyahu kind of uh, uh, event, whereas in Tel Aviv uh, it is much more economic in orientation. So the tone uh, against Netanyahu is different in the two places. And the question is, will the two uh, crowds will be able to join forces or not? Because if they will not be able to join forces, then each of them is uh, uh, too small, uh, although very, uh, very vociferous, but uh, too small in numbers in order really to bring about a change. Mm -hmm. Well, I will end with a, a, a pessimistic and optimistic note. The pessimistic one would be that, um, again, we, we're witnessing a continuation of the political crisis, and it demonstrates how precarious our democracy and democratic institutions are, a lot more precarious than, uh, than many of us, including myself, uh, imagined uh, in the past. And, and in this respect, it's very important that we're able to sort of cross through this uh, volatile uh, period. And, and the more positive note is that we're seeing so many Israelis who love the country and are going out there without a leadership, without a political leadership in, in uh, hundreds of junctions and are so involved and are so creative. And, and there's something, uh, I must say, uh, uh, heartwarming and that demonstrates how uh, Israelis respect the, the uh, across the spectrum the, the the basic notion of freedom of expression, uh, freedom of demonstration, uh, and in this respect, uh, uh, that basic level of our democracy is sound and solid, and uh, and and provides a good uh, uh, basis for optimism. I always like to end on an optimistic note, so thank you for for that. Thank you, Tamar. Thank you, Yochanan, for your wisdom and for taking the time to share with us today. And of course, thank you, as always, for your partnership, for IDEA's partnership with JFN. We really always appreciate being able to work with you to, to give up to the minute information to our members. And we look forward to continuing that partnership and having more programs going forward in the coming months. So I want to say, I want to wish everybody well, stay well, stay safe, and we'll we'll hopefully have more chances to learn together in the future. Thank you, have a good day.